If you found this website, you're no doubt familiar with VR Don Core, or at least you're familiar with his notebook. Viard's notebook from the early 12th century preserves dozens of drawings. In some cases, they're purely figural, here showing how to make foliate carvings of bearded men. In other cases, they're studies of nudes, studies of drapery, studies of perhaps Viard himself and a snail, and repeatedly, architectural details. In other cases, chapels at Cambrai, studies of the apse at Rance, the interior of the same apse, column details of how to fit and join column shafts and colonnettes to columns themselves, more interior exterior elevations, flying buttresses, and chapel plans have all suggested that Viard might have been an architect. It's also been argued he could have been a mason, a carpenter. He certainly traveled a lot. He certainly saw churches. He certainly saw things in churches and recorded them for posterity. What he also recorded were simple practical techniques. For example, here are some geometrical layout rules, how to s determine the height of a tower, how to determine voussoirs of an arch to be cut. Trusses over side aisles. Here the famous page of mechanical devices. A hydraulic saw, a crossbow trap that never misses, or so he claims. Here an engine to lift great weights. And this he labels below in this faint lettering, how to make an angel keep pointing its finger towards the sun. Perhaps some sort of slightly misunderstood clockwork system. The wheel is, of course, a vista symbol, and we thought it would be a fitting tribute to Carl, in honor of his new facsimile, to build a scale model of VR's perpetual motion machine. As you can see, VR took a great deal of care in drawing his wheel. He drew the wheel itself with a compass. He very carefully rendered the spokes of the wheel to make it look three-dimensional, having the hub pass over the front of this back side of the wheel, and behind where the wheel comes around the front. He drew the hammers in their appropriate positions, hanging down below, resting on the rim at the top. You can see that he drew the frame afterwards, having to erase part of that hammer. But he even modeled the point of dowels that go together to join the components of the frame. So, using this drawing, measuring it carefully, putting those dimensions into an Excel spreadsheet, and then scaling it so that the entire model was a manageable size, but big enough that we could see its effects, George and I set to work building a replica. George tackled the problem of the frame, building it carefully and in the style that medieval carpenters would have used with mortise and tenons and peg joints, and Steve took on the wheel, along with hub and axles, there allowing a little bit more leeway to use modern methods for joining as well as construction. The finished reconstruction, as you'll see in a moment, gave us a good deal of insight into what VR drew, how it was supposed to work, but in particular how the actual wheel with hammers around the rim does work in the real world. So here we've got a replica of VR's hammer wheel. We took his drawing, scaled it up so that the main wheel is 24 inches in diameter. Uh, since we didn't have perfect uh, ideas for cross-section, uh, we scaled things proportionally as best we could. Other than using modern hardware, it's effectively built fairly similar, similarly to the way someone in the Middle Ages would have done it. The place where we particularly uh, changed was in the hammers we're using plexiglass. More on the hammers in a minute. The idea is pretty simple. The hammers hang from the wheel, they're pivoted, they're free to swing uh, as the wheel rotates. As you can see, those at the bottom hang like pendula down at the bottom. Those on the top, their edges rest on the wheel because they only have a certain range of motion. And the idea is, as the wheel swings, as one of the hammers comes over the top and breaks free past the point, as are binding a little bit, that swing, and in particular that hammer, that kick, 
is supposed to drive the wheel around. So as Viard says, how to make a wheel that turns by itself. Notice that he never says perpetual motion machine, but we won't split those hairs right now. Here's how we made the wheel. You can see each hammer is sandwiched between two halves of the overall wheel, and those rims are made up of plywood. Each half of the rim is made up of two layers of half-inch plywood. You can see the joints there. Those are third segments, one-third of the entire wheel, staggered so that no joints overlap. The hole is bolted together with bolts with nylon washers. And from the inside, you can see the oak spokes, which are mortised into the hub, also go out and are sandwiched between those two layers of the wheel. The hub itself is a piece of turned elm uh, set to take those spokes. The frame, built by George Brooks, as you can see, is mortise and tenon all along. There you can see the hub itself is attached to the frame using two lag bolts, very non-medieval but very functional. It also allows disassembly fairly easily. Uh, the frame is made of cypress and has no metal connections. They're all mortise and tenons with dowel joints. So, first thing to notice is that the wheel tends to sort of fall back to a neutral position. If it's anywhere out of symmetrical, that is, say, with the hammers on the far side up, hammers on this side down, it swings back. There's one clue that tells you this is never going to work as a perpetual motion machine. The second thing is, the idea is, as these wheel hammers are balanced, each one will kick it around further. But I can tell you right now, as I'm holding this, I can feel a very strong pullback in that direction. And even when these things get to the point where they do swing, there's no or there, there's still a considerable restoring force in that direction. So what happens, you'll see in the next clip. What happens with the wheel when you rotate it up to some kind of high velocity, or at least moderate velocity, is you would think that the hammers would be flinging out, kicking it around. In fact, what happens is that they tend to slow the whole thing down. The yard's wheel acts more like a brake than it does a perpetual motion machine. So here you can see what happens. and it actually turns backwards. Now, admittedly, some of our hammers are sticking a little bit due to uh, warping in the wood. That aside, there's absolutely no way you can get these things, even with nicely greased uh, pivots on the handles, on the hammer handles, to uh, continue its motion. What you'll notice is that it tends to work like a pendulum, and this isn't surprising. Here's the basic idea. The center, or the wheel itself, has a center of gravity right at the axle. That wheel, that's pretty straight and easy to find. If this was just a wheel, no hammers, basically like a bicycle wheel, if you spun it up, allowing for friction, it would spin nice and uh, freely. It would probably spin for quite a good time because most of the mass is outside of the edge. For those who know physics, high moment of inertia because the mass is out at the edge. The problem comes in, or the reason it doesn't work as a perpetual motion machine, is because the hammers are out here, right? And the hammers either hang down if they're at the bottom or they flop over at the top. That is, they don't sit out here. If all the hammers were extended out perfectly radially, then it would be like a sort of extended bicycle wheel with spokes sticking out. And again, if you spun it, it would spin quite freely and probably keep spinning quite well. But because they're down, look what happens. For the wheel itself, the center of gravity is at the center, because it's symmetrical about that. The center of gravity of each of these hammers is in the head give or take, because most of the majority is in the head. Remember, we used about 600 grams of birdshot in each hammerhead, so each one of these weighs maybe 800 grams. But the center of gravity is going to be in, this, um, in the hammerhead. Now what happens is, the center of gravity for the entire system is the sum of all the center of gravities. So, center of gravity of the wheel is in the middle, center of gravity of this one is here, plus this one is here, plus this one is here, plus the one down there at the bottom, and what you can see is, very rapidly, the sum of all of these, the center of all of those is going to be below the center of the axle. And what that means is that the center of gravity for the whole system is below the axle. And what that means is you've got a pendulum. There's no way for this machine to have a center of gravity anywhere but below the axle. And what that means is that it can never move by itself. That's why it works just like a pendulum. It swings just like that. As to the individual hammers, what we did was use standard builder's mallets from Great Britain. Uh, this shape, although in America we might consider it to be a little bit of a cartoon shaped mallet, is the standard medieval mallet. It's the standard wooden mallet you can still buy in hardware stores or as they would
we call them in Britain ironmonger stores. Um, and I've seen similar mounts for sale in Spain and Germany. The shape works perfectly. The slightly beveled uh, faces with a, a standard handle, these are very inexpensive, only a few dollars. They do perfectly well for pounding pegs in, adjusting 2x4s, um, as we like to call it, the impact adjustment for fixing things around the house. Because we've added the plexiglass cover to each hammerhead, you can see inside the hammerhead is birdshot. We've added about 600 grams of birdshot inside the hammerhead. It's free to flow in and around. You can see the shaft of the mallet is still in there. But it's free to flow in and around as the ham hammer rotates around the wheel. Viard said in his manuscript, here's how you do it with a wheel using hammers or with quick quicksilver. Now most historians have assumed that he meant put quicksilver inside the hammerheads. Uh, in the article referred to on this page on Viard's perpetual mobile, that may not in fact be what he meant, but regardless, historians have assumed this, so that's how we built it. As you can see, the birdshot stays level. That is, it sort of flows somewhat like a liquid um, to fill the bottom bit of each hammer. You can see this flow to an angle right there. As the wheel goes round, that bird shot is supposed to flow, again adding a little more impulse to the uh, hammer wheel. So as you can see, Viard's perpetual mobile is anything but a perpetual motion machine. It tends to slow itself down, it swings like a pendulum, and doesn't do a whole lot. It's pretty to look at, but it is not a wheel which moves by itself. What we found interesting when we demonstrated this at the Kalamazoo Medieval Congress was people coming up afterwards and saying, well, what if you lengthened the hammers? What if you added more weight or took more weight away? There was this incredible belief, incredible desire to believe, that this thing should be able to work. There's a long history of perpetual motion schemes, long history of perpetual motion scheme failures. Viard's is no different. I don't think he ever built it personally, but even if people had, I'm sure there would have been people in the Middle Ages saying, but what if we did this? And what if we did this? There must be a way, because there just must. Well, this scheme at least doesn't work. We hope that this perhaps inspires you to build a desktop model or a large model. Um, if you ever get it to work, please email us. We'd love to know about it. Thank you.